1 Samuel chapter 17. 1 Samuel chapter 17. The title of our message tonight is How to Slay a Giant. How to Slay a Giant. We are finishing up our verse-by-verse study of chapter 17, and in this, we have come across the story of David and Goliath, the actual historical tale that nearly everybody in this country is familiar with. <laughs> I was looking up something today, uh, just, I just typed in David and Goliath, and Google brought up all of these, like, I mean, contests throughout, and it was all it, where, where David and Goliath was put in. It was, you know, football teams, you know, uh, like, a, like a championship team playing the worst team in the league, and it was a, they won, and it ended up being a David and Goliath, like it's just a reference that we sort of throw around, right? When we talk about Goliath, we talk about giants, we talk about slaying giants, I think it's important before we go too far to define what the giant is. Because in the story, it's just a nine-foot, 700-pound man with heavy armor and, and great war experience. But it's metaphorical as well. For you and me, the giants in our lives come in the form of abuse, comes in the form of bitterness, comes in the form of unforgiveness, temptation, fear. These things can be giants in every single one of our lives. Uh, the giant that was in my life for a long time and, and, and finds its way back into my thinking occasionally is discouragement. I don't know why. I'm not 100% sure why. I've kind of searched my mind, gone back into my upbringing and so on and so forth, but, but from time to time, for whatever reason, this is the tool the enemy uses to really attack me. It's just discouragement. I remember when the church was, when we were very first starting the church, I'll never forget our first service. I was supposed to start at 6.30, but there were only two people here. And so we waited, thinking, no, 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 I take that back. I had that mess. I had it wrong. We were supposed to start at 6, Okay. But, I, but when I waited at 6 o'clock, because there was only like two people sitting in the church at that time, and this was our very first service in Florida. It was such a big deal and it was such a moment. I knew there was a lot of people who said they wanted to come, but there were only two people there at that time. And so I just waited until <laughs> like 6.30, you know. And then four, four or five more people came, and I remember at our very first service, we had like 17. Now, for me, that was just like amazing. I'd been thinking about this church for, for so long. I've been thinking about what it was going to look like and how, who was going to come and people getting saved and just these great, awesome things in the Lord. And we had 17. Our second service, we had 23. Our third service, we had 27. Um, and then we got to our fourth service, and then the numbers kind of just sort of steadily went up. And then I'll never forget it. Um, we had one service where we had like 16 people. And I was so discouraged. Now, the church at that time was really only about like 26, 27 adults. And what happened was is we had one big family go on vacation. <laughs> right? But to me, it was like we were, we were building. We were going somewhere. We were growing. And all it took was one family going on vacation. The funny thing is mentally I knew this. Right? I understood people go on vacation. I understood this, and I knew that this is kind of what happens. It will fluctuate. But for whatever reason, I went home that Sunday, and I came home, and privately, not in front of anybody, but privately, I just fell apart. I felt like I, I was for sure no one was coming back the following week. I did something. I said something. Something happened. And for that week, I had such a dark cloud hanging over my head. That's just a small example. It gets bigger, and there's a lot more stories I can share with you. But I share that one because for some of you, it's depression. And for others, there's past abuse, which has led to bitterness and unforgiveness. And this, this, this thing is so big to you, and you've tried so many times to overcome it that perhaps you've sort of given into it and just simply decided to live with it and just said, this is the way life is. I'm going to just give it a name, carry it around with me like a pet. And it just sort of stays that way. But is that the way that God has intended your life to be? Is this God's will for you? Does God look at you and just say, well, I'm sorry, young Christian. You're just not very good. You're just not very faithful. So this is your lot and this is just where you're going to live. Or does God look at you with compassion and say, 
Give it to me. Let me take care of this for you. Well, I would argue for the latter, and I would argue also that in this story that we have, in this historical document that we are reading, we are going to come across the keys for slaying a giant. Last week, in the first part of chapter 17, we got to know our enemy, and we, of course, we, we knew that this was not a flesh and blood type of fight, that this was a spiritual battle. Paul touched on this in Ephesians chapter 6, um, uh, in, in the putting on the armor of God, verses 10 through 17, being strong in the Lord and the power of his might and, and the armor that we have, the breastplate of righteousness and the helmet of salvation and shodding our feet with the preparation of the gospel and the shield of faith, the belt of truth. And then our offensive weapon was the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. He says, these are the tools you have to fight the spiritual battle. So as we go through the story, I kind of want you to keep that in mind, that while we have a real flesh and blood battle here, this is spiritual, this has spiritual roots to it, and this is what leads to victory, and this is what leads to a very small man, young boy, having a victory over a very seasoned warrior many times his side. So if your Bible is open, verse 20, let's read verses 20 through 27 together. Hey, Rich, can you bring me down just a little bit? I got that echo up here. Thanks. So David rose early in the morning. He left the sheep with the keeper and took the things and went as Jesse had commanded him. And he came to the camp as the army was going out to fight and shouting for the battle. For Israel and the Philistines had drawn up in battle array, army against army. And David left his supplies in the hand of the supply keeper, ran to the army, and came and greeted his brothers. Then as he talked with them, there was the champion, the Philistine of Gath, Goliath by name, coming up from the armies of the Philistines, and he spoke according to the same words. So David heard them. And all the men of Israel, when they saw the man, fled from him and were dreadfully afraid. So the men of Israel said, have you seen this man who has come up? Surely he has come up to defy Israel. And it shall be that the man who kills him, the king will enrich with great riches, will give him his daughter, and give his father's house exemption from taxes in Israel. Then David spoke to the man who stood by him, saying, What should be done for the man who kills this Philistine and takes away the reproach from Israel? For who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? And the people answered him in this manner, saying, So it shall be done for the man who who kills him. Let's pray. Father, we thank you, Lord, once again for this night. Lord, we thank you for this time to open up your word, Lord. And as we do, Lord, we pray that you will shine the light of truth into our hearts, into our minds. Lord, that you will just open up our eyes and our understanding, Lord, to these battles that take place, Lord, in our world, to the spiritual battle that takes place for the souls of each and every person on earth, and, and that which the army wants, or the, the enemy wants to do to kill, to destroy, and to steal our joy. Heavenly Father, I pray, Lord, that as we leave here tonight, Lord, we would walk in your victory. For the battle's already been won, death has been destroyed, and the power of the Holy Spirit resides in us, Lord. If we have been chained down, Lord, if there are chains of bondage, Lord, from past hurt or unforgiveness, bitterness, whatever it is that's too big for us to handle in our flesh, Heavenly Father, I pray for great work, Lord, signs and wonders this evening. I pray, Lord, that you will free people, that you will break these chains. And Lord, that your power may be evident right here in this house. And we pray these things, Jesus, in your holy name. Amen. So David now has arrived to the battlefield. And if we remember from last week, we learned some things about the enemy. We learned that, that the enemy wanted to draw us onto his battlefield. And the Philistines drew up, and they were on one side of the valley of Elah. They were on a hill. Uh, the Israelites were on the other side. There was a valley between them. Neither one of them wanted to go down and put themselves at a tactical disadvantage for this war. So really all they did was get up on these hills. They would dress up. They would hoot and holler and, and, and sort of just look at each other, right? Have you ever seen like a, a fight in, at school or something? You know, I, I, it's funny. When I see these things, I always say, people always do the, the, the gorilla bump. You know, you see two guys getting ready to go at it, and they bump in chests like this. That's kind of what these armies were doing, just sort of standing there, just looking at each other. But to break the stalemate, this Philistine named Goliath, he was nine feet tall, five to 700 pounds. His armor was massive. He was a giant of a man. Comes down, and he, and he determined that we don't have to have all this bloodshed. 
We don't have to have the armies fight. And I tell you what, I'm the champion. You send your best guy out. We fight it out right here. And whoever loses will become the slave of the other side. That was the deal. Now, as we pointed out, this is what Satan does. Satan wants to draw us onto his battlefield where he has the advantage. He determines the rules of the fight. He determines who you will fight and how you will fight. For you, your, your, your thing might be different. Like because in this story, it's a little man, or it's really just a big man calling out other soldiers to a physical fight, which he clearly had the advantage. But for you, the giant might be different because the enemy knows your weaknesses. For you, your, your, your disadvantage, your weakness may not be por- pornography. Maybe it's alcohol. And so for you, that's going to be the giant that's going to draw you onto his battlefield where he knows in the flesh he can take you down. Whatever it is, it exists, and this is what Satan wants to do. Draw us onto his battlefield, determine the rules of the fight, determine who you're and how you're going to fight, because that's where he has all the advantage. So that's where they left it for 40 days. He used fear as the best tactic, and he called out the army of Israel and and shouted at them, and there's probably nothing harder for a soldier to hear than to be called out on their manhood and bravery. So for 40 days, these guys are getting worn down, knowing nobody's going to rise to the occasion. Meanwhile, the the, the scene sort of shifts over to Bethlehem where Jesse had told his son David to go out and and, and tend the sheep, which which is awesome because David had already been anointed king of Israel quietly. All of his brothers were rejected. Nobody really knows kind of what this means yet, but, but David uh, uh, being anointed this right after that, it says the spirit left Saul, and so he gets called to play music, to be a worship leader, literally for the king. He winds up being the armor bearer, so he's close to Saul, and at some point, he goes home to feed the sheep, and then this whole, this whole fight with the Philistines sort of kicks off, and he's with his dad. So just circumstance has it, his dad says, listen, I'd like you to take this bread and cheese to your brothers and go, go check on them, go give me word. And, of course, we understood that to mean pizza, right? Bread, cheese. Pick a couple tomatoes along the way, you got a pizza. So I can't say, I just can't think of that without pizza. I just, I'm sorry. Plus, my, my, my daughter watches VeggieTales, and, and in VeggieTales, he's got a pizza, so. It. So David now shows up. He goes there. He sort of puts the stuff where, where it's supposed to be, he gives it to the the, the keeper, uh, the, the, the captain of their thousand. And, and so now he's going to check on his brothers. But while he's there, the Philistine comes out as normal. He goes through his routine of calling out the Israelites as normal. But the armies are out. They're sort of, you know, making their noise. And they're, 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 they're sort of bravado up on top of this hill when this giant comes out. And David starts listening. And he sees what's going on. And it's interesting because he doesn't say he's going to do something about it. He basically says... Somebody should do something about this. And notice what the king is doing. Remember, we said that the king was supposed to be the one fighting him because Saul, we found out, was head and shoulders above everybody else. He's kind of the biggest guy there. And he was a brave soldier before the Spirit of the Lord left him. So now, you know, he's not willing to go out there. So what's he trying to do? He does what a lot of people do when they're facing a giant. He tries to buy his way out of it. He tries to pay money. What does he do? He offers up... You know, a big, big, big dollar amount offers up his daughter. I'm sure that made her feel good. You know, well, thanks, Dad. I'm a war trophy. Wow. And, of course, I guess we can't assume she was a trophy. I don't even know. Maybe for the guys, it might have been like, what? Which daughter are we talking about? I don't know. <laughs> we don't know. I mean, it was more than that. I don't think it was the girl that was a really big deal. Basically, it was marrying into the king's family. And then, they, you know, of course, the family's going to be exempt from taxes because if you look at the first two things, the first two things are only a benefit if you survive the fight. When I, when I, was, when I was thinking about this, I was like, it kind of reminds me of the movie Titanic where the guy's trying to buy a seat on the lifeboat from somebody else who's already on it. And the guy's like, what good is your money here? What am I going to do? Go to the go to the store in a sinking ship and buy a Corvette? You know, like, it's only good if I survive this thing, and I'm going to die in 20 minutes if I get off this boat. So what difference does it make to offer up all this money? But he's trying something. He's trying to motivate somebody, and then he says, well, then your family will be exempt from taxes. So at least if you die, your family is good, but it's only good if you kill the Philistines. So it's really not uh, a big benefit. But David hears this, and I want you to key in because this is our very first step. In verse 26, it says, Then David spoke to the men who stood by him, saying, What shall be done for the man who kills this Philistine and takes away this reproach from Israel? 
Now, he's just sort of asking, wait, what were you talking about? But listen to what he says. For who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? Whoa, that's important. David has just mentioned a couple of things that I think that we should key in on. Number one, he says he calls him an uncircumcised. Now, normally that doesn't mean a whole lot to us, but to the Jews, circumcision was an act of obedience to God's law. So what he's really saying is, who is this guy that doesn't even follow our God? He's not a, you know, and he might be you know, like, well, this guy is clearly not a follower of Yahweh. You know, we might look at this and be like, well, he's definitely not a Christian. So if he's not a Christian, look, there's only two gods you can serve here, right? You either serve Satan or you serve God. There's no fence. And by the way, even if you want to ride the fence, Satan owns the fence too. So you're still on his side. There's only two directions. There's light and there's dark, right? You're either walking in the light or you're walking in darkness. There's no third direction. And you can lump all the other gods that people serve all around the world into one pile and say, this is darkness and this is light right here. And so he recognizes this Philistine is not a servant of God. And he also recognized something else. He was a Philistine, and the Philistines worshipped false gods. So not only was he not a follower of Yahweh, but he worshipped a different god. So it's clear he's walking in darkness, and it says, but then he's defying the armies of the living God. Whoa. Okay, so David is making some connections here just with his speech that we need to know. Number one, he's not a, not a follower of God. Number two, he worships false gods. And number three, he's defying God's army. What does that tell you about what this battle really is about? Right? I think it's, I, I think it's so good if we identify the giants because he sees things for what they really are. This is a physical, fleshly battle that is taking place. There's a real man in the flesh out there, and he's the problem. The Philistines on the hill, that's the problem. Wait, but this is, this is, this is, this is the enemy taking on our God. This is transcending that. What's really behind the flesh and blood? Oh, it's Satan that's motivating this, and he recognizes that. Because this takes it from a fleshly battle to a spiritual battle. Now, it's important in your life, you recognize what's a spiritual battle and what is not. Okay, because sometimes I'm taking, you know, you have people at sort of both extremes on this. Sometimes somebody goes out and says, oh man, my car doesn't start. Now, that's another attack from the enemy. No, you just didn't turn off your dome light. Right? Oh man, I got lung cancer again. Well, it's just another satanic attack. No, that's from 30 years of smoking. Right? Sometimes, we suffer consequences of our own doing, and this is not a satanic attack. Sometimes we give them way too much credit. But then on the other end of the spectrum is those who only see things through the flesh. And nothing is a spiritual battle. Listen, we do have a real enemy. There is a real devil. There is a real Satan. He does have demons. Paul talks about it in Ephesians 6, 10 through, through 11. He says, we do not battle flesh and blood, but against powers and principalities and the, and the rulers of darkness of this age. He says there are levels of demons. They are real, and they inspire real fleshly kind of attacks on you. So how do you determine what's a spiritual attack and what's not a spiritual attack? Well, first of all, you can determine it. You can ask yourself, what have I done to cause this? Is this a consequence of my own actions, or is this the enemy coming against me? And if, for, for what purpose? Right? If you're suffering but the, but for un, under uh, this, this plane of bitterness and unforgiveness... Something did happen to you that caused the bitterness and the unforgiveness, and, and you can't impugn that. I won't take away the pain from that because that could be a real giant for you, okay? And it may be your choice because you're not forgiving, or perhaps you've tried to in your own flesh and it's not working. But does the enemy have real incentive to keep you upset and bitter and depressed? Absolutely he does. And so will he speak into your mind thoughts and lies that you may believe and keep continuing in this? Yes. Oh, yeah, that's a spiritual attack. That is absolutely a spiritual attack. Satan has a, a vested interest in making you obsolete in the world. Z Satan will keep you depressed, frustrated, busy, angry, tired. He will do all of these things to keep you from being a functioning, joyful Christian that reaches other people in this world. I think there's a spiritual battle when someone gets saved. The enemy immediately attacks, usually through friends and whatnot, but... We need to identify it, and he definitely identified it here. This is an ungodly man from an ungodly place who's attacking the armies of God. This is a spiritual battle, and the first, the first, way, the first 
possible step you can take toward a solution is identifying the problem. And he has definitely identified the problem. So, verse 28 Now that David has identified the problem and he has mentioned it to a few of the guys standing around him, it says, verse 28, Now Eliab, his older brother, heard when he spoke to the men, and Eliab's anger was aroused against David. And he said, Why did you come down here? And with whom have you left those few sheep in the wilderness? I know your pride and the insolence of your heart that you've come down to see the battle. And David said, What have I done now? (laughs) This is two brothers talking to each other. What have I done now? Is there not a cause? Then he turned from him toward another and said the same thing. And the people answered him as the first ones did. David, remember, if we have to go back a little ways, we we recognize that that Satan had a purpose in this battle, which was to wipe out God's people. This is, he was using the Philistines to try and wipe out God's people. The end the giant is is a part of this plan that's sort of working. But we have to remember that Satan's power only extends as far as God lets it, lets it go. Right? We, we find this out in the first chapter of the book of Job. When Satan shows up and says he, was, he, he came in front of God, and God says, where have you been? He says, I've been going to and fro, <laughs> seeking whom I may cause problems for. You know, I can imagine how that conversation really took place. And then he says, have you considered my servant Job? And, 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 and he says, well, as a matter of fact, I have. Now, I'm prayer phrasing this just a little bit. This is the new Aaron version, so I'm giving you so you understand. But Satan says, yes, I have considered him. And by the way, I can't do anything to him because you won't let me. You've blessed him. You've done this. You've done that. And that tells us a little something about Satan's power. He can't get to those whom God says no to. Right? So now that David knows he's, what this battle is about, and he seems to be the only one who's stepping up and speaking boldly, and he's ready to do so, he's ready to take a step of faith, and I think that God has allowed this battle so that David will come, and this will be his sort of coming out party as king of Israel, even as a young man. David shows up, and he's ready to take the step of faith, and what happens? His relative on his side of the battle line is the one who's calling out his motives and cutting him down. Isn't that awful? (laughs) His brother Eliab, his oldest brother. Well, we're told when Samuel went to anoint the boys because God had told him to go to Bethlehem, find Jesse and one of his sons that I tell you. So when Eliab walked in, Samuel looked at him and said, whoo, that's got to be the one. He looks like a king. He looks tough, brave. You know, who knows what he actually looked like, but for whatever reason, Samuel looked at him, this man of God looked at him by the flesh and said, this has got to be the guy. God says, nope, not him. Go on to the second. And he went to the second, the third, the fourth, the fifth, and finally getting to David after all the other brothers had passed by. And so now Eliab comes up, and now he's calling out David and his motives. And you know, this is so interesting, because when you... Once you understand what the battle really is about, and you're, and you're ready to step out in faith... You need to prepare for the pushback, and sometimes it comes from people that you think are even on your side. Marginal Christians, I say. I I never forget when Robin and I answered the call to go to Mexico. This great step of faith, and we worked through a lot just to get to that place, and by the time we knew this is where we were going, this is the time that we began to announce it, <clears throat> to all of our friends, and, and, and my, one of my best friends at the fire department, and he's still a, a great guy. If I ran into him today, we'd pick up right where we left off. He was a good friend of mine at the fire department. He was a Christian guy. He got mad at me and basically accused me of uh, abandoning the guys at the fire department and said, well, we need Christians here too. Why do, why do they need you more than Mexico? You're not even from there. And he got frustrated. Like, he was really upset. He was, he was upset then, that I was leaving them and the guys, and that's the way he viewed it. Now, he didn't stay there, but this was a real blow to me. I thought, wait a minute, you're my brother. <laughs> you're a Christian. And, and I would expect, you know, I'm about to take the step of faith. I'm, I would have expected you to be happy for me. I would have expected you to support me in this. You're the guy coming now causes me to question everything I have. And you know what is, he, he, actually, what he questioned my motive was that I was just sort of onto a new adventure. And just sort of leaving the work to the guys behind. Well, it's like, well, no, that's not what it is. But sometimes, sometimes people, and, and we're going to just step out on a limb here. Eliab was probably not the most spiritual man. 
up to this point. Clearly, he didn't have the faith that David did, even though they came from the same family. So, you know, what, did he believe in God? Probably. Was he, a, was he an every Sunday Christian? Probably not. He was a very marginal guy. And David steps in, and he thinks he's got the whole thing read right. And I'm going to tell you this. When you make that choice to take a step toward the Lord, I, I've seen this happen over and over again. Sometimes it's a, a friend that misunderstands. Sometimes it's somebody from your own church, and sometimes it's somebody from your own family. And you know what? Uh, you have to make a choice at that time. Am I going to listen to the Lord, or am I going to listen to the people around me? Well, David listened to the Lord. He knew exactly what was going on here. Second Corinthians 10, 4 through 5, later on, Paul will remark about this. Though, though we walk in the flesh, we do not battle according to the flesh, because our weapons are not carnal but they are powerful for pulling down strongholds and casting down arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against God. And David understood this and knew that. So when he had the pushback, what did he do? Verse 29, it says, um, oh, verse 30, I'm sorry. It says, then he turned from him toward another. <laughs> his brother's coming out, calling out his motives. And what does he do? He ignored it. He ignored it and just kept on going. I love that. Verse 31, it says, Now when the words which David spoke were heard, they reported them to Saul, and he sent for him. Then David said to Saul, Let no man's heart fail because of him. Your servant will go and fight with the Philistine. Now David's ready to, now he's going. First he said somebody should do something about it. Now he's saying, I will go and do something about it. And Saul said to David, You are not able to go against the Philistine to fight with him. You are a youth, and he a man of war from his youth. But David said to Saul, your servant used to keep his father's sheep. And when a lion or bear came and took a lamb out of the flock, I went out after it and struck it and delivered the lamb from its mouth. And when it rose against me, I caught it by its beard and struck and killed it. Your servant has killed both lion and bear. And this uncircumcised Philistine will be just like one of them, seeing that he has defied the armies of the living God. Notice he said that. Notice he said, he has defied the armies of the living God. Moreover, David said, verse 37, the Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and from the paw of the bear, he will deliver me from the hand of the Philistine. And Saul said to David, go, and may the Lord be with you. <laughs> I'm just wondering how he said that. It's funny because David is speaking really bravely amongst the soldiers who are not so brave. Speaking pretty big words about what somebody needs to do about it. And all of a sudden, his words get back to Saul. And Saul's probably excited because somebody's finally stepping up to the plate here and is going to go fight. And can you imagine his discouragement when this 15-year-old boy walks in? This is our description of him. He was ruddy and good-looking. That's it. So this boy walks in, and he's probably walked out and pucked, you know, peeked out the tent. He's like, hey, did you, did, was there a guy coming in after you? Are you the guy? And you could, I don't know, if I, if, if, if I were writing this scene in a movie, you know, I would give, you know, King Saul like this big, deep, you know, James Earl Jones kind of voice, and, I, and I'd give David like Mickey Mouse, you know. <laughs> don't worry, King. <laughs> I'm going to save you. <laughs> you know, David comes in, he's this young man, and Saul's going to be like, I thought there was a man here going to take on Goliath. Don't worry, get behind me. I got you. You know, you can't fight him. Are you kidding me? You're just a kid. And he's been fighting battles as, as he was old as you. And he's way bigger than you. He's, you know, like you can't, you can't compare to this guy. I love David's response, you know, and this is because this is what really ties in with you and me. David said, well, I was shepherd of my father's sheep, and we had lions and bears out there. And you know what? If a lion came and took one of the sheep, I actually tracked down the lion and I held him down, I got the sheep back, and I killed the lion. <laughs> what? <laughs> this, is, this, is quite, this is quite a kid. We know two things. That is brave to take on a lion. And two, this didn't happen in California because you can't kill a criminal when they're going away. <laughs> Thought I would throw that in there. I just read that article tonight. I was like... So, I've killed the lion and the bear. He says, David, notice, I want you to notice because this is where, this is where the rubber kind of hits the road for you and me. He didn't start off killing giants. Did you notice that? All the while he was in the wilderness, God was preparing him. 
He had all that time to have fellowship with the Lord. And he writes many of his psalms later on about water and trees and the stars and how they compare to God and how God has created all things. And he has these beautiful poems that he writes. You can imagine so much time to think. And he was a good shepherd. He didn't just, you know, it wasn't like he didn't care about the sheep. You know, he might have, he might have been just a real matter-of-fact sort of shepherd. I'm sure they existed. be like, yeah, well, you know, you lose a few. You know, lions come and get them, it happens, but I'm not risking my life for that lamb or bear. I mean, hey, if it comes between the lamb and me, I'm going home to my family. That might have been the attitude of some, but not David. David was a good shepherd, and so is Jesus. Jesus is the good shepherd. Jesus says, not one of my lambs, and you're one of mine, I protect you. And so he protected them, but I want you to know this, and this is so important. He didn't simply start killing giants. He started taking steps of faith before he ever even knew it was going to matter later on. And I want to encourage you in that too, because if you're not faithful in the little things, you'll never be faithful in the big things. You'll never be faithful in the big things. Rick Warren tells this story. I don't know if you know this. Rick Warren is a big pastor out in California. They've got a really large church. Um, I've been to his church um, and I've walked the whole campus, and it, it's just, it's, it's mind-boggling how big this place is and how many facilities and staff, and I'm just, it was just, man, how does this happen? I mean, it's kind of a neat guy, and I listened to one of his stories, and I just assumed he was just a super mega, mega church pastor that was very rich and untouchable, and I found two things out about him that totally changed my mind about him. Number one, before service every single Sunday, he goes out on the patio, and he's greeting people coming in. 27,000 people come into that church every Sunday, and he has one rule. He will not talk to anybody he knows. Like in a church that big, it's pretty easy to find people you don't know. But his point is this. He can be out there greeting the sheep as they come in. For me, as a pastor of a church, I look at that and I think, well, if he can be out there with a church that big, then what excuse have I got? Right? That's the one thing that changed my mind. The second thing about him that I was very impressed by was that he wrote this book that is one of the biggest best-selling books ever, He's made all this money, and I'm sure they make a lot of money in the church as well. Do you know that he's a 90-10 tither, which means he tithes 90% of in, his income and lives off the 10%. And now his critics say, yeah, well, your 10% is a whole lot more than my 100%. You know, of course you do that. He says, but I don't have to do that. I can keep 90, and I can tithe 10 and still be under what you might consider the law. I tithe 90 because I know where it came from. You know, and you think, well, if I had that much money, I'd tithe 90%. No, you wouldn't. No. If you don't tithe what you have now, there's no way you would tithe when you have a lot more. If you're not faithful in the little things the Scriptures tell us, that even what you do have will be taken away from you. It's faithfulness in the small things that leads to faithfulness in the big things. That is the path. That's why 1 Timothy chapter 3.10 tells us about talking about deacons, talking about character, and says, but let them first be tested. You must first be tested, and when God has tested you and you have found faithful in the small things, then sometimes there's a giant and you have the faith to take on something greater than yourself. So David makes his case. Saul has no other options. <laughs> he says, go, and hopefully the Lord will be with you. Verse 38, he says, So Saul clothed David with his armor, and he put a bronze helmet on his head, and he also clothed him with a coat of mail. And David fastened his sword to the armor and tried to walk, for he had not tested them. <clears throat> and David said to Saul, I can't walk in these, for I've not tested them. So David took them off. Saul tried to give David his armor. I've, I find this fascinating that he does this because... David has already decided that the battle is spiritual. Saul had no ability to look at this as a spiritual battle. He only saw things through the flesh. So by giving him his own armor, what he was saying is, his son, I, you know, he probably, I'm thinking about this from Saul's perspective, he probably put his armor on David and then went back and started wondering to himself, I wonder what it's going to be like being a slave to the Philistines. Huh. I mean, the armor might protect you for a little while, but you've got no chance, kid. Take my armor. What was he, Saul was putting his own unbelief on David. 
And David looked at it. He tried to put it on. He's like, I can't fight in these. You know what's so important? You can't neither. You can't fight with somebody else's armor. And, and I would even say this. I would extend this a little bit further. And hopefully I'm not taking too many liberties here, but I think I'm on the right track with this. When you are doing something great for the Lord, or when you're facing a major giant in your life, be it whatever it may, you get a lot of advice from people. And a lot of times you get worldly advice from people. And sometimes you even get worldly advice from worldly Christians. And I want to help you understand something. Worldly advice plus God's word doesn't make something better. God's word is pure and it is true. Think about 100% pure water. This is God's word. The psalmist Psalm 119 writes that your, your, your word is a lamp to my feet. It guides me on my path. If God's word is pure and God's word is true and men's hearts are sinful, that means the best advice that man can give you is nowhere near 100% pure. So you can't take what is unpure and add it to that which is pure and make it better. You just simply make that which is pure unpure. Does that make sense? You can't take God's word and mix it with worldly advice and put it together and say, yep, I'm good now. No, you either follow God's word or you follow world's advice. And this is what's happening with David. David's trying to put on armor. This is Saul's advice. Saul's not a spiritual man. If you're getting advice from people, and this is the best thing I can tell you, you're going through something difficult, hard. You've got a giant that you're up against in your life. Pay attention to who's giving you advice and from where their life really is coming. Look at the fruit in their life right? It's very important. It's very important. Think about this. Would you take how to quit tobacco lessons from somebody who has to take the cigarette out of their mouth to teach it to you? No, of course you wouldn't. You wouldn't go to a, 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 an alcoholic on the street of Fort Myers and ask him, you know, how did you get clean from drugs? Well, let me tell you. Well, like, why? Think about this for a minute. Would you get worldly advice for a spiritual matter? You cannot. You can only use spiritual words, which is the word of God. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12. The word of God is living and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, able to, to pierce down between bone and marrow and right down between the division of soul and spirit. It is alive. It is powerful. It is God's word. It's God's inspired word. And between the covers of this book, you have all the instructions for every problem that everybody faces. And if this is not your guidebook, then you're going to be fighting spiritual battles with fleshly weapons and you will lose every time. That's playing on Satan's battlefield. This is the battle he always wants to draw you into. If you're not willing to follow the word, then you're only going to be able to follow the world. And this is where you lose. Make sure when someone else is giving you advice that they have the track record to back it up. And when you get advice from people, make sure they're godly people. And I don't just mean people who talk about God. I mean people who show it with their life. People have the fruit to back it up. Verse 40 says, Then he took his staff in his hand, and he chose for himself five smooth stones from a brook and put them in a shepherd's bag, in a pouch in which he had, and his sling was in his hand, and he drew near to the Philistine. So the Philistine came and began drawing near to David, and the man who bore the shield went before him. And when the Philistine looked about and saw David, he disdained him, for he was only a youth, ruddy and good-looking. That's how that, that description keeps on coming. It must have been a really good-looking kid, because like the, the Bible says it like three times. So, so the Philistine said to David, am I a dog that you come with me with sticks? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. Ooh, you done messed up, Goliath. Cursed him by his gods. It says, and the Philistine said to David, come to me and I will give your flesh to the birds of the air and the beasts of the field. <laughs> Then David said to the Philistine, you come to me with a sword and a spear and with a javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. This day the Lord will deliver you into my hand, and I will strike you and take your head from you. And this day I will give you the carcasses of the camp of the Philistines to the birds of the air and the wild beasts of the earth, that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. Israel. Then all this assembly shall know that the Lord does not save with a sword or a spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into our hands. Man, David, I'm telling you, if you, if you want to learn how to talk spiritual trash, this is it. Right? David 
nailed it. And notice what he's not doing. He's not, he's not walking out like Muhammad Ali and saying, I am the greatest, float like a butterfly, sting like a bee, no one's as good as me. You know, he's not going out there and talking and building himself up. What did he say? You have defied the armies of the living God. Notice when Goliath came out, he saw him and he thought, this isn't going to be a fight. What are you sending? What were you, out of rabbits or something? What would you send the kid out for? He doesn't even have any armor. I'm not going to get any glory from this. This is like fleeing away a dog. He says, come on over here, kid. I'm going to tear you up and give you to the beasts of the field. Now, I would say this. It's one thing to talk big to a bunch of soldiers and say somebody needs to do something about it, right? It's another thing to sit in front of the king and talk about what you're going to do because you've had victories in the past. It's another thing to stand before a giant on a battlefield with everybody watching and be able to put together something coherent like this. But David understood something very well. He was a channel, not the source of power. This battle belonged to God. He was just the front man. It wasn't size that he needed. It was faith that was required. Faith in God and God's word. He knew from the gospel, or from, excuse me, from the book of Genesis, he knew that when God said to Abraham, those that bless you, I will bless, and those who curse you, I will curse. He knew 100% this was a spiritual battle. They were coming against Israel. God was on his side, and he was merely going out as his representative, and by faith, he said all these things, and I love this. I, 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 when you get to heaven, you've got to pull this DVD and see the look on Goliath's face when David starts talking this way. David says, no, I'm not just going to kill you. I'm going to cut your head off. And all the Philistines back there, all your whole army, you guys are all going to be bird food by the end of the day. He says these things. There's another real application for us here as well. What was Goliath, what was his purpose in talking to David? His purpose here was to cause fear, wasn't it? Same tactic he was using when he was coming out and banging the drum and telling, you know, calling Israel out. You know, he was calling out their manhood and telling them that they couldn't fight. He was doing the same thing to David. Listen, if you were going to step out and you were going to do anything in the Lord or you're going to fight your own battles, you're going to walk in faith and you're going to desire to please God, you're going to have to listen or you're going to have to ignore the lies of the enemy, and you're going to have to learn to listen to God's voice. David spoke on behalf of God. He said, God will deliver me. The battle belongs to the Lord. He will deliver you into our hands. This is how it's going to work. You have to learn to listen to the voice of the Lord. In prayer, you have to learn to listen to the voices you are reading your Bible and discerning when God is speaking to you. I've had so many moments and had one today where I was down reading my Bible and I got something I'm thinking about in my head and I'm not even thinking about what I'm reading, but I'm reading and, and, and I get into it and all of a sudden there's a scripture that pops off the page and there's the answer, there's the solution to my problems right there. You know that happened to me when I got really discouraged when I was talking about earlier was is discouragement. I don't know why it comes over me. It's just sometimes everything in my life can be so good and just all of a sudden I would just come with this overwhelming feeling that everything is falling apart and, and, and I'm not pleasing to God and, and just, you know, all these thoughts just begin to flood my mind. I don't know what it is. And you know what, it, you know what happened? It was Philippians chapter 4, verses 6 and, six and 7. Be anxious for nothing and all things in supplication and prayer with thanksgiving. That's the part I didn't want to hear. You don't want to be thankful when you're discouraged. But I'm kidding. Man, I tell you what, it changes everything. God spoke to me through the scriptures. Well, actually, first he spoke to me through my wife, and she told me to knock it off. So I guess I, I, then I went to the scriptures. I went to the scriptures, and then, that, then God spoke to me. So I figured I'd throw that out there because she's sitting in the back, and I want her to like me. So <laughs> learn to ignore the lies of the enemy and listen to the voice of God. So... David's talk big. What happened? Verse 48. So it was when the Philistine arose and came and drew near to meet David that David hurried and ran to the enemy to meet the Philistine. Then David put his hand in his bag and he took out a stone and he slung it and struck the Philistine in his forehead so that the stone sank into his forehead and fell on his faith, face to the earth. So David prevailed over the Philistine with a sling and a stone, and struck the Philistine and killed him. <laughs> but there was no sword for David to cut his head off. <laughs> the story just cracks me up. It, every time I read about this part, you know what it reminds me of that part in, in, in Indiana Jones, where he's on the street, 
And that guy comes out and attacks him in the street, and he's got the sword, and he, gets, and he does all the things with the sword. Da, 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 da. And, and then Indiana Jones pulls out a gun, and boom. You know? I thought, this, this is great. Goliath, the enemy, what was he doing? He tried to draw him out. You're too, you know, what was he saying? You're too small. No one can fight me. I'm too big. And everybody looked at him and said, he's way too big. We cannot beat this guy. All it took was a young man with one of these. This is it. This uh, was bought for me for, for, from a friend here uh, that saw this. This is somebody who makes what they call David slings. And, and I was out afternoon throwing rocks with it today to see if I could <laughs> hit something. I'm pretty sure I could have hit Goliath, but I wasn't very good at hitting, like, trees. Uh, but this is it. How do, you, how, do you, how do you defeat a giant with a sword? Don't get close enough for the sword to hit you. This was it. How could there be an entire army up on top of a mountain with swords and bravado and everything? How could there be everybody up there and nobody thought, maybe we should just shoot this guy? It took a child. It took, took David to go out there. You notice what he didn't do. He didn't bow down. He didn't start praying. He didn't start asking God, Lord, look, this would be a really good time for a lightning bolt. be a great opportunity to put some fire down on him. I know you're going to do it for Elijah later. be a great opportunity to open up the earth just like you did in, you know, in the book of Exodus. That would be awesome. David ran toward his enemy, and this is an application for you and me. When we face our giants so often, we just want to run from it. We're afraid. We let the fear take over, and fear is always, always, always a poor decision maker. In that moment, it says Goliath started running toward him. And what did David do? He started running right back. Let's close the distance. Reached in, grabbed a stone, and by the way, I found out that these stones... Um, they weren't actually small. I, I assumed it was like a small pebble stone, but it's not. It's actually some of these stones that they, they've actually, archaeologists have found these sling stones, and some of them are the size of like tennis balls. Can you imagine that? I mean, it's, I, you know, I, a baseball player can throw a ball pretty fast, but with this sling, I was reading up on it. I wasn't, didn't have any, a big field to do it on or anything, but I started really hucking them pretty hard, and I hit a tree and it took some of the bark off because I was using bigger. I found out the bigger rocks are easier to, to use in the sling. But man, if I could just really load up and let one of these things go, it says that a good sling thrower can throw a rock the size of a baseball about 1,000 feet with a sling. I mean, I was trying to find out what the ballistics would be behind that, you know, just getting hit. But can you imagine getting hit with a stone baseball in the forehead at that speed? It says here in Goliath, it sunk into his forehead. It actually went into his head, pop, killed him right there. And to the surprise of everybody but David, the giant fell. And he didn't have a sword. He couldn't. He didn't even have a sword on him. He had no weapons of warfare that man would have gone into this battle with. It says, verse 51, Therefore David ran and stood over the Philistine. He took his sword and drew it out of its sheath and killed him and cut off his head with it. And when the Philistines saw that their champion was dead, they fled. Wait a minute. That's not the rules of the battle. Wait a second. You, done, you made up the rules for the battle, and when you lost, you ran? I thought we were supposed to be, I thought you were supposed to be slaves. What does this tell you about Satan? He can't be trusted. He will never abide by even the rules that he will hold you to. He can't be trusted. You don't make no deals with him. You don't make no deals with the world. Don't make no deals with Satan. He will, never hold, he will never abide by them. The champion is dead, and by rule, they should have been the slaves. What did they do? They took off running. It says, Now the men of Israel and Judah arose and shouted and pursued the Philistines as far as the entrance of the valley and the gates of Ekron and wounded the Philistines, uh, and they fell along the road to Sherim, even as far as Gath and Ekron. Then the children of Israel turned from chasing the Philistines, and they plundered their tents. And David took the head of the Philistine and brought it to Jerusalem, but he put his armor in the tent. So it went, right after he killed the Philistine, you may imagine that probably a hush fell over everything. Like how is this, you know, everybody's watching the battle. Everybody can see it. So they're watching him. They go out. They just watch him get the sling out. Boom, thunk, down. Everybody was like, is he going to get up? <laughs> like, that can't be it. How anticlimactic. It's a good thing they didn't pay for tickets to that. 
It wasn't anything that happened. He just fell and he's dead. And David's looking around and says, I don't have a sword. Well, I guess I'll use his sword. We're talking about how big his sword was. He probably could barely even pick it up. He pulls it out. He cuts off the giant's head. And he probably packed it around for like a week, you know. He's a young man. I, don't, I mean, it's really morbid. But it does say that he took it to Jerusalem. And this that meant when, when David became king, he conquered Jerusalem. And then he had Goliath's head put up in there. You know, some people have like deer heads and bear heads. And, you know, right in between all that was that like Goliath. I wonder if he put a little smile on his face or something like that, you know. I, I know, my mind really ran away with me this afternoon. I thought he cut off his head, you know, he's like, he's like packing it like this, and he probably turned around to the Israel art, and he's like, let's go, boys, you know, like make his mouth move, let's go. I don't know what he did with it, but he did, he did take it. I mean, it must have been a massive noggin, so he packed it all the way back up to the top. Soldiers run off and start killing the Philistines, and David, you know, packing this thing up, and here you go, king, I said, you know, bang. Yeah, the Bible is it's kind of weird when, when you get into talking about things like that, but... I'm weirder, so. <laughs> so they arose, the fight took place. Verse 55 says, Then Saul saw David going out against the Philistine. He said to Abner, the commander of the army, Abner, whose son is this youth? And Abner said, As your, son, as your soul lives, O king, I do not know. So the king said, Inquire whose son this young man is. Then as David returned from the slaughter of the Philistines, Abner took him and brought him before Saul with the head of the Philistine in his hand. So that's, what I, that's where I got that. He was still packing it around. And Saul said to him, Whose son are you, young man? So David answered, I'm the son of your servant Jesse of Bethlehem, the Bethlehemite. Now, it wasn't because Saul didn't know who David was. Clearly, he knew who he was. He was his armor bearer. But what he's really asking is, where in the world did you come from? I thought you were just some kid from Bethlehem that knew how to play guitar. How did... Who are you? Who is your family? Well, he just simply answers, I'm the son of Jesse the Bethlehemite. But the giant's dead. David recognized the battle for what it really was. He was prepared for the pushback that even his brother wouldn't sway him. He was prepared for the battle because God had been preparing him and he was diligent in the little things. He was faithful in the small things. He didn't listen to the bad advice of the world, but rather listened to the voice of the Lord. He ignored the lies of the enemy and knew how to hear God's voice. He ran to the problem, put his faith in God, and he had victory. And you, my good friends, will have victory as well. These are the steps to slaying a giant, and I don't know what the giant represents in your life. I do know this, that Satan has a vested interest in keeping you Depressed, discouraged, frustrated, angry, powerless, and focused on everything else in this life except for the Lord Jesus Christ. And Paul says, if you will simply understand that the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they are powerful in God for pulling down strongholds. If you will just understand that you can walk in truth and that belt will keep your life together and all of your stuff. If you will walk in righteousness as I have commanded you, that will protect you and your chest and your vitals. And if you will realize and just believe that if you have given your life to Jesus Christ, that you didn't have to earn it, that you are saved, that will protect your head. And if you will put your faith in me, you will have a shield ready to quench the fiery darts of the evil one when he tries to take you down. And if you keep that sword of the Spirit on you and you memorize this thing because no one can take this thing out of your heart, then you too will be victorious over whatever giant that God is allowing you to face in order to teach you to be strong in the power of the Lord and in his name only. I'll be up here for prayer after if you've got something on your mind or if you've got something particular you're facing. You don't have to tell me about it. Just tell me that you want prayer and if you want to talk about it, I'd be willing to talk about it with you. We can come up with a battle plan. But I want to see people get delivered and I want to see people walk in the joy of the Lord because I know that he's delivered me and he will deliver you too. Let's pray. Father, we thank you, Lord, for your word tonight. Lord, we thank you for... This recorded word that we have, Lord, as I'm reminded that in so many places in the world, this book is actually illegal. They're not allowed to have it. And so people are 
smuggling them in and quickly memorizing chapters of the Bible and whole books in some cases. Sometimes it's just from little strips of paper smuggled into their home or their cell. Father, we have this freedom that we enjoy here, Lord. We have these Bibles that we can study and we can memorize, Lord, in this time of peace. Heavenly Father, I pray that we would do this. We wouldn't take this peaceful time, Lord, to simply play into ourselves and be more comfortable or build bigger barns or take longer vacations, Lord, but that we would be in training, Lord, for you to build your kingdom, knowing, Lord, that eternity is a lot longer than this life. Still, Lord, in this life, we are plagued by many giants. We have issues, Lord. We have the enemy that wants to take us down. He wants us to keep us focused on ourselves and our problems, and he wants us to be bitter, Lord, so that we're not lights for you, and we're not sharing the gospel, but that we get so focused on ourselves that we become not useful. Father, I pray for joy for each and every person here tonight and regardless of what they're facing, Lord. I pray that you would deliver and break chains, Lord, that need to be broken, that have gone on sometimes for generations and families. I pray, Lord, for your deliverance tonight. I pray, Lord, that we'd have the faith to step out and walk in your power. I pray these things, Jesus, in your holy name. Amen. God bless you all. I love you. I will see you on Sunday morning.